Always We ask the question. What is needed in the world? This was the moment when South Africa's last white leader announced the release of Nelson Mandela and the end of apartheid. I wish to put it plainly that the government has taken a firm decision to release Mr. Mandela unconditionally. I'm serious. I'm serious about bringing... In a speech that stunned Parliament and the world, Frederick Willem de Klerk, or FW, unbanned the African National Congress, lifted the state of emergency, and promised equal rights for all that would lead to South Africa's first fully democratic elections. There's Mr. Mandela, Mr. Nelson Mandela, a free man. Within days, anti-apartheid icon Nelson Mandela walked free after 27 years in prison. Mandela could not have brought about the end of apartheid without the F.W. de Klerk figure. Um, it, it took the, the pragmatism, the heroism and the vision of an F.W to enable Mandela to be ultimately successful. We pray for God's guidance. I thank you. A deeply conservative politician steeped in apartheid ideology, F.W. was never known for his reformist instincts. But he'd come to realize secretly that in his own words, to cling to power for the white population group means facing a revolution. We must find a way in this country as blacks and as whites to live together in peace. Revolution almost came anyway. In the townships, ANC supporters battled their rivals in the Zulu-dominated Inkata Freedom Party. The Afrikaner resistance movement, meanwhile, threatened bloody revenge. Finally, lengthy negotiations resulted in a non-racial constitution and elections in 1994. Millions of black people cast their votes for the very first time, overwhelmingly endorsing the ANC and Nelson Mandela as president. In 1993, F.W. de Klerk shared the Nobel Peace Prize with Mandela in recognition of their work together to end apartheid. He now heads the Global Leadership Fund, working with 24 former leaders to promote good governance worldwide. Frederick Willem de Klerk, better known, of course, as F.W., former state president of South Africa, the man credited with engineering the end of apartheid, joint winner with Nelson Mandela of the Nobel Peace Prize. Thank you, sir, for talking to us on Al Jazeera. It's a pleasure. I'd like to ask you now about your own journey. Back to 1990 and compounded in the years that followed, many of your supporters and your people, the Afrikaners, saw the moves that you made as a giant act of betrayal. Many others, of course, saw it as a giant act of courage. What, what was it, in your view? Was, was this something motivated by personal conviction, or did you simply feel forced by the hand of history to do what you did? The most important driving force which brought us to do what we did was conscience and ethical conviction. Once we said to ourselves, which we did in the early 80s and the middle 80s, that separate development, as we prefer to call apartheid, has failed to bring justice to the overwhelming majority of all South Africans. We had to then say to ourselves, but that means where we are is morally indefensible. And this took place within the National Party. And we, we came to the conclusion there we must abandon this policy. We can't fix it. Like my friend Gorbachev continued to believe in communism, and he said it, it must just be more open and more democratic, but communism is a good philosophy. We abandoned the concept of separateness and substituted the concept of togetherness in a new vision for South Africa. 
And the main driving force, as I've said, was to do what would ensure justice for all. When the nation state concept, which is still being accepted by the whole world as the best solution to bring justice to the Palestinians and to the Israelis, this is what we tried to do in South Africa. But when that failed, because of many reasons, the whites wanted too much land for themselves, we became economically totally interdependent and, and integrated. Uh, we became an economic omelet. You can never unscramble an omelet. We reached a point where it was no longer possible to achieve justice through the route of separate nation states for each of the black nations forming part of the South African nation. Sanctions played a part. International pressure played a part. I'm not playing that down as if it didn't mean anything. It kept us on our toes. It forced us to accelerate some reforms which took place already from the late 70s. Uh, it had a great effect. But once again, on balance, on a scale, it was the issue of inner conviction for me and for my fellow leaders in the National Party, the issue of inner conviction which made us do take the quantum leap which we took, the 180 degree turn which we initiate. Is it then your defense of apartheid that a policy of separateness was intended to provide and bring about justice for all South Africans? I supported the policy for that reason because I believe that through the nation-state concept, full political rights could be given and achieved by all people in South Africa. Meaningful rights. The moment I became convinced that it wasn't a sudden flash, it was a process. But the moment I said to myself, look in my internal reflections, this is never going to bring full justice to everybody. That moment, it would be wrong to continue adhering to a policy which you then said, even it was, if it was attended to bring intended to bring justice, it has failed to do so and therefore it's morally indefensible. I do also want to add the indignity which apartheid has brought about for people has never been right. It was regarded wrongly as an interim phase. It became institutionalized. And for this, I made a profound apology at the Truth and Reconciliation Commission and at other occasions. So I'm not defending the inherent wrongness of apartheid, but I'm trying to explain why I and my people for some time sought a political solution which would give us a country of our own with a right as a distinct nation, the Afrikaner, with the right of self-determination, which is recognized by the United Nations uh, Treaty. Is there a part of you that wonders what if what if all those years ago the black majority in South Africa had in fact risen up against the white minority and your government in a similar fashion? I have no question in looking back and looking what is happening elsewhere and what has happened in the past 20 years in other countries that we were destined to end up with something equivalent to a civil war. That we were destined to end up where not fully democratic regimes tend to end up and that is becoming totally internationally isolated. If we did not take the initiatives we took, I have no doubt in my mind that we would have reached a point that the majority of all the people in South Africa would have taken hands with the total international community and would have united behind one common goal and that is to overthrow the regime. We avoided that and the challenge for leadership is to avoid that and to get ahead 
of the process instead of being totally reactive all the time uh, where things get out of hand. 21 years ago, in 1990, you unbanned the African National Congress. You announced the formal end of apartheid. Crucially, you ordered the release of Nelson Mandela from prison. Over th the succeeding years, you worked very closely with him and with the ANC, his party. Do you think now that the ANC has remained true in the last 17 years of power to his vision, to his spirit, and to itself? Unfortunately, I have to answer no. I don't think so. I think that there was uh, initially a gradual moving away from his vision, from his emphasis on reconciliation, from his commitment to true non-racialism, to the point that where we are today, where I think the ANC has lost its moral compass. It has fallen back into a form of uh, allowing race to dominate almost their total thinking. Uh, they have fallen into the trap of unbalanced affirmative action. I support affirmative action, but not the way it's being done. Of unbalanced black economic empowerment. Uh, of dividing society again, they are failing on the major goal contained in our negotiated constitution, and that is that this society must become a non-racial society. South Africa has staggering social problems, we know that. Enormous unemployment, particularly among the youth, millions of people living in poverty. The government continues to claim that that is a legacy, a throwback to the policies of apartheid, the policies, in other words, of your government of the day. Is that something you accept? I don't accept it, and I think uh, almost from month to month, uh, the uh, veracity of that statement uh, is being undermined. It's losing its veracity, in not in gradual terms, more and more black South Africans today are saying, you can't blame apartheid. You've been in government now since 1994. You must take responsibility for the mistakes you've made. I think part of uh, the lack of job creation lies in irresponsible threats, which the present leadership of the ANC allows to be made, although they distance themselves from it with regard to nationalization of the mines, and that raises the question in people's minds, if that were to become reality, what will next be nationalized? So economic growth through the private sector is really the only way in which we can create those jobs. And the question needs to be asked, and it is being asked in the debate which is taking place. What are the stumbling blocks to real dynamic economic growth? While we're doing well in international terms, growing 3 5%, we need to grow at 8 9% if we want to, to catch up with the backlog we have with unemployment. And we need to make investment attractive rather than allowing economic debates which make investors hesitant. You worked very closely, of course, with Nelson Mandela during the transition phase and afterwards. Uh, the two of you shared the Nobel Peace Prize, famously. You were ideological opposites, of course, and you clearly and sometimes publicly had your differences. What was he like as a man to work alongside, to be a partner with? Nelson Mandela is a very special person. He deserves the accolades he gets. He had and has a strong personality. He's a man of great integrity. In uh, very real pragmatic terms, I found him easy to talk to. He is an analytical thinker, and I think I'm quite analytical myself, 
he's a good listener, I'm a good listener. So we never had problems in communication, even about the most sensitive issues. However, there was a phase, and it was quite stretched out over a few years, where our relationship became very strained because of ongoing political violence, to the point that he publicly started accusing me of not being in charge or of looking away and allowing things to happen, which made me very unhappy and, uh, and I felt very hurt. His greatest legacy will be his emphasis and putting the deed, adding the deed to the word on the need for reconciliation in South Africa. You've written that you remain to this day good friends. Is that true? Yes, we remain good friends. I, in his old age, he's not very healthy at the moment and he is uh, frail. I try not to bother him unnecessarily, but we see each other, we talk on the phone, we are visitors in each other's home. One question which is very often asked abroad, outside of this country, uh, is about a post-Mandela South Africa. So much is made of Mandela as this country's moral compass. You suggested earlier that the country has already lost its moral compass. Is his legacy, do you think, strong enough to keep this country together? I think his legacy is not being honored by the present leadership in the ANC. But I am also aware that there are important role players in the ANC who are concerned about this and who are trying to promote a return to his values which he enunciated so clearly and which he adhered to so admirably. So I think yes. I know it's often said that there will be a crisis in South Africa when Mandela dies and we hope it will not happen soon. I believe the opposite. I believe his death will bring about a moment of taking hands of everybody in South Africa. A stepping back from what is unacceptable at the moment and will be a moment for a rethink where are we going. And in that sense of the word, I'm not afraid of big unrest when Mandela goes. I think it will be a sobering moment for all South Africans. Mr. de Klerk, you've written extensively recently about your views on the upheaval taking place in the Middle East and North Africa. Given your deep experience of South Africa's own extremely complicated political transition, you must be watching all this with intense interest. Absolutely. Uh, comparisons are odious and it would be wrong to think that our model is exportable to other countries in transition uh, as it was. But I think there are some lessons to be learned from our experience. I think the biggest challenge which is being faced uh, in the many Middle Eastern countries and North African countries going through this phase now is that one needs to structure a negotiation. In the end, if I look back, our success was that, that we succeeded in getting on an inclusive basis all the major voices and parties and organizations together and drew them into a meaningful uh, solution-orientated negotiation process. Let me ask you about South Africa's role currently in international affairs. On Libya, for instance, South Africa voted at the UN in favor of the resolution calling for a no-fly zone, but then criticized the way that it was being implemented. At the same time, on Zimbabwe, much closer to home, South Africa consistently fails to exhibit anything more than what's often called soft power. Is there a bit of a fine line here between reaching for a high profile abroad and yet appearing non-committal in one's own backyard? Well, within South Africa, the, the government's foreign policy 
is heavily criticized quite regularly. I think part of the explanation is an historical one. Uh, in the years when the ANC was a revolutionary movement, when it was banned, it relied heavily on the support from a number of sources. Included in those sources were Zimbabwe, Libya, Russia, China, and other countries in sub-Sahara Africa, which housed the uh, ANC military people who were in exile. So there is a residual, uh, I, think, I think a feeling of residual, we owe a debt to those who helped us when we needed help. And when those who helped them are now going wrong, there is, to my mind, an unacceptable hesitancy to, to say, no, now you are doing the wrong thing. But that's the only reasonable explanation I can think of, is these, uh, it, it, it is the historical ties uh, which they had with a number of leaders, including Mugabe, including the leader of Libya. A and yet, if what is happening now means that South Africa is to a degree turning its back on Mr. Gaddafi, the country has frozen Libyan assets here. They have voted in favor of, of international inter intervention of a sort. Do you think that means that it becomes increasingly hypocritical to refuse to act against somebody like Mugabe? I think in the case of Mugabe, it's different. What is happening in Zimbabwe is to a certain extent also our problem because of the closeness of Zimbabwe because maybe almost 50% of the people of Zimbabwe are in South Africa at the moment, legally or illegally. Uh, and in that sense of the word, while I'm not justifying the too soft approach that South Africa has towards Mugabe, I can understand it that, that they don't want a total implosion in Zimbabwe because it will have an immediate further additional spillover into South Africa, which might not be in the best interests of South Africans. So now there is greater cohesion within SADC, the Southern African organization. There is more pressure on Mugabe. It is as a result of that pressure inter alia that we have a sort of a government of national unity in Zimbabwe at the moment. What must now happen is South Africa taking the lead, the African Union must now ensure a free and open election as soon as possible in Zimbabwe. And if it's properly monitored, it will mean that Mugabe will go and that you will have a new government installed. Have you reached a point in your life where you have developed a very clear sense of your place in history, your legacy? what you would like that legacy to be? I don't break my head about what I would like my legacy to be. I think historians and history will, uh, will find a way of, of recognizing what I've done. I get enough recognition as it is. I don't see myself in competition with Nelson Mandela in any way whatsoever. And I didn't do what I did to get recognition. It had to be done to avert a catastrophe. It had to be done to bring justice to all. The only way forward was the way we chose. Any alternative would have resulted in a terribly negative situation. F.W. de Klerk, many thanks to you, sir, for speaking to Al Jazeera. Great pleasure.